Christ Central. Hi, welcome to Christ Central. Hi, welcome to Christ Central. Welcome to Christ Central. Welcome to Christ Central. Good morning, my name is Dan. I'm one of the pastors here at Christ Central. We're so glad that you could join us today for our online worship service. And if you have kids, we also have a Christ Central Kids family worship video on our YouTube page that you can watch with your family after this worship service. And if you're new, we would love to connect with you. Please go to our website and fill out a connect card. That way we can personally reach out and welcome you to Christ Central. And for every connect card that we receive, Christ Central will donate $10 to a local charity that you can choose from on a list. And so if you're worshiping with us for the first time today, please make sure to fill one out. And in terms of offering, you can give online or by text or by mail. And I have one announcement for us today. Our next next drive-in worship service is on May 16th at 11 a.m. at the Artesia campus. Signups will begin one week before on May 9th at 5 p.m. on our website. And we're going to continue with the recent changes we made at our drive-in worship service. Everyone now is more welcome to interact more freely while wearing masks and maintaining six feet social distancing. And if you like, you can even bring your chairs and sit with others during the worship service. And restrooms will also be available. And just as a reminder, parking spots are limited, and so you will need to sign up to attend. And during our drive-in worship services, one of the biggest blessings has been partaking in the Lord's Supper. This is a very important part of every believer's spiritual health. And so if you're able and comfortable, we encourage you to attend our next drive-in worship service. And as usual, we'll always have our regular online worship services every Sunday at 10 a.m. Brothers and sisters, it's God who graciously calls us and invites us to worship him. The call to worship today comes from Psalm chapter 67, verses 1 to 5. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Brothers and sisters, with gladness and joy, let us worship God in this first song of praise. Everyone needs. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of a can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Forever, author of salvation, 
heroes and conquer the grave. Jesus conquer the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save, forever, author of salvation, heroes and conquer the grave, Jesus conquer Every Sunday, we want to spend meaningful time confessing our sin to the Lord. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 5 to 6. Then Samuel said, Gather all Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. The pouring out of water may have been symbolic of them pouring out their hearts. Water was also a precious commodity necessary for life. And this may have been symbolic of them saying, this is how serious we're taking our sin. This is how seriously we're taking repentance. Brothers and sisters, at this time now, would we pour out our hearts before God, taking our sin seriously and taking repentance seriously? Let's pray. Would you now hear these comforting words of assurance in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18? Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you have sincerely repented, God hears and God forgives. It is because of the blood of Christ that our sins, which are like crimson, can be made white like snow. Would we now respond to the forgiveness and mercy we have just received as we sing this next song of praise? Father's 
As part of our worship service, every Sunday we confess our faith in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. A catechism is a summary of Christian doctrine in question and answer format. I'll read the question, and together as a church, we'll read the answer. Question 19. What is the misery of that state into which mankind fell? All mankind, by their fall, lost communion with God, are under his wrath and curse, 
and so are made liable to all the miseries in this life, to death itself, and to the pains of hell forever. Praise be to God that Jesus satisfied the wrath of God and that he took the curse that we deserve so that we would not be liable to the pain of hell forever, but rather experience the joys in heaven forever. Good morning. My name is Daniel. I'm one of the pastors here at Christ Central, and it is my pleasure and privilege to bring the Word of God today. Uh, We are in Mark chapter 9, verses 2 to 13, and you can turn there in your Bibles. It will also be projected on the screen. Mark chapter 9, verses 2 to 13. May God the Holy Spirit bless the reading and preaching of His Word. This is the scene of the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the son of man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why did the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the son of man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come and they did to him whatever they pleased as it is written of him. This is God's word. Radiant and intensely white. That's what the disciples, Peter, James, and John saw in this mountaintop experience when they witnessed the transfigured Jesus Christ. The word transfigured simply means being changed in appearance. And Mark tells us that Jesus, his appearance became radiant and intensely white. And Mark even uses this uh, laundry analogy, talking about bleach and how bleach is used to make clothes whiter. Uh, A more modern analogy comes to mind for me. I think of HID headlights, high intensity discharge headlights. Uh, These are uh, special headlights that are much brighter than the conventional halogen headlights in your car. But the problem is sometimes people install them incorrectly and it becomes too bright and it becomes even a detriment for other drivers on the road and it can even be unbearable. It can even leave you incapacitated as another driver when you see these bright lights. And that is kind of like what is happening to the disciples as they look upon the transfigured Jesus. They are incapacitated to a large degree. They are dumbfounded. And as Mark tells us, they are terrified. This is what happens when Jesus peels back the curtain, even just a little bit. When he reveals who he truly is, when he reveals more of his glory, more of his deity, they get terrified. The disciples, they knew Jesus' humanity very well. But perhaps when they see his divinity, it's a totally different story. And sometimes... They need to see his divinity more to really get who Jesus is. And maybe that's you too. It's Christology 101. Jesus is fully God and fully man. 
Uh, we just went over this with the essentials class very recently with a great group of people where Jesus is two distinct, indivisible, inseparable natures in one person, right? God and man. And neither of these two natures diminish the fullness of the other nature. This, this is good theology, right? That uh, Jesus' deity doesn't make him any less a man. And Jesus' humanity doesn't make him any less God. That Jesus truly is the God-man. And when Peter in our story today sees the God in this God-man, he gets frazzled. He's like a deer in headlights. He doesn't know what to say, but because he's Peter, he still says something anyway. And, you know, I kind of went through an experience, a reaction like that recently as well. Uh, as, as many of you know, we had our, uh, our daughter, Emery. She was born about two months ago. And, you know, on that day in the hospital, when she first came into this world, oh man, I'm sure you can imagine, I'm sure many of you have been through this, I was just so overwhelmed. And I looked at Priscilla, and I saw how overwhelmed she was, and that made me more overwhelmed. And I was in such a daze that the nurse actually had to ask me, Dad, are you okay? Right, I think maybe she thought I was going to faint or something. And I just said, "Mm -hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And if you asked me in that moment to say out loud what was going through my mind as I was so dazed and overwhelmed and befuddled, it wouldn't have been a very good thing to say. It wasn't something useful or helpful. You know what I was thinking in my mind at that very moment? I was looking at my baby and I was thinking, her shoulders look so muscular. Why does Emery's shoulders look so buff? Right, and thankfully I didn't say that out loud. But if I did... Maybe Priscilla would roll her eyes a little bit. Maybe the doctor and the nurses would have thought I was weird. But for sure, that would have been the wrong thing to say in that moment. And Mark, our gospel writer today, makes clear for us that Peter said the wrong thing. That what he said was wrong. He didn't know what he was saying. Just to refresh your memory from verse 5 of our text, Peter says to Jesus at the moment of the transfiguration, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Now, what's so bad about that? What's so bad about that? He wants to honor Jesus, Moses, and Elijah by making tents for them, uh, to give them a place to rest and to relax. Perhaps it's Peter's even thinking theologically, where he's thinking of tabernacles. He, He wants to make three tabernacles for these three great men of God. But what he's saying is wrong. He doesn't know what he's saying. And the voice of God then appears through a cloud. And in a sense, his God the Father, he offers a correction. In Mark 9, 7, in verse 7 of our text, it says, A voice came out of the cloud, God the Father's voice, and he says this, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. This is my beloved son. Notice that God the Father doesn't even mention Moses or Elijah, even though they're there. And he only bestows this special honor to Jesus. This is my beloved son. And this is indeed a correction for Peter. Many, many, many interpreters throughout the ages have all noted that the mistake Peter makes in what he said is he places Jesus on the same level as Moses and Elijah by saying, yeah, we'll just, we'll make three tents for each of you. Now we got to put ourselves in the shoes of Peter and the disciples. You got to think they were probably so starstruck in this moment, right? Because They've been with Jesus now for some time, and Jesus is familiar to them. But Moses and Elijah, oh my goodness, these guys are heroes of our faith. These guys are our forefathers. These guys are historical figures. We've heard so much, so many stories, and we read so much from the scriptures about them, but we've never met them. And now here they, here they are right in front of us. And so Jesus would just get just another tent. I do want to explore with you just a little bit of what are Moses and Elijah even doing here? Why are Moses and Elijah here on this scene of the transfiguration? Sure, 
Both Moses and Elijah were men who met with God on the mountaintop. They each had their respective mountaintop experiences as well. So it is, it is pretty fitting that they're also here. And classically, uh, it's understood that Moses represents the law and Elijah represents the prophets. And together, if you combine that, that represents the entire Old Testament. And Mark tells us that Moses and Elijah are there and they're talking with Jesus. And although Mark doesn't tell us what they're talking about, thankfully we have the gospel of Luke as well. And Luke tells us that Moses and Elijah were talking with Jesus about his departure or his exodus in Jerusalem, about what he was going to do in Jerusalem, his, his mission in, in Jerusalem, namely, especially, of course, dying on the cross. And there's this sense in which Moses and Elijah, they're there and they are so caught up in who Jesus is. That's all they're talking about. They just want to talk and, and find out more and look into what Jesus is doing and he's going to do. And, and they're just caught up in that. And it kind of reminds me of 1 Peter 1.12 when it tells us that even the angels, uh, they, are, they long to look into the things of the good news of Jesus Christ. Even the angels are so caught up in who Jesus is and what he's going to do and how he's going to be the savior of sinners And they're caught up. Moses and Elijah are caught up in Jesus. And so Peter is wrong to just give Jesus just another tent. That's the first correction we see here at the transfiguration. Please don't give Jesus just another tent. If Jesus is the beloved son of God, if Jesus is the one who is intensely radiant, how can he be just another tent? In your life? How can he be just another tent in your heart? You have one tent for your family. You have one tent for your money. You have one tent for your politics. You have one tent for your leisure. You have one tent for your sexuality. And then just another tent for Jesus? No, of course. The transfigured Christ, as we see him here in Mark 9, shows us it does not work that way. He wants all of your life. He wants all of you. Oh, so pastor, are you telling me that uh, the only way to be a true Christian is I have to be like this fanatic who is always, literally always bringing up Jesus and always inserting Jesus into everything and everything I, have, everything I do has to be all about Jesus. I can only read Christian books and watch Christian movies and listen to Christian music. Is that what you're saying? And Tim Keller, uh, in in an Easter sermon from many years ago, he offers a great answer to that. Tim Keller writes, or rather he says, A person with a passion for Christ is not necessarily always talking about Christ, but is looking at everything through Christ. And he even says, Jesus is like my glasses, right? When I have a proper relationship with my glasses, when they're on me, I see everything in the right way. Jesus is like those glasses. And of course, it's never a good sign. It's never a good sign if you're never talking about Jesus. That's not a good sign. But for Jesus to have all of your, all of your life, it, it doesn't mean that you, you don't care about your family or you don't care about your career or you don't care about politics or you don't care about entertainment. But it means that Jesus is the lens through which you look at all of those things. Jesus is the one who sets your perspective and gives you clarity and the proper order and the proper priority to all those areas of your life. He is that big tent that covers over all the other smaller tents. There should be no tent that you can walk into where Jesus is out of sight, out of mind. There should be no corner of your life where Jesus doesn't have jurisdiction. And if you are a Christian today, I think it is very important to ask ourselves, are there any tents in my life where I'm keeping Jesus out? Are there any tents in my life where where Jesus is not there? Don't give Jesus just another tent. He is the beloved son, the intensely radiant one who wants all of you 
and he is worthy of all of you. That's the first thing Peter got wrong. But there is one more. Once again, refreshing your memory. Peter offers, as well, and he also basically volunteers his fellow disciples that they're going to make these tents for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. And, you know, we shouldn't be too hard on Peter, right? After all, Peter is simply rising to the occasion despite the incredible nature of what's happening. Peter is just trying to be useful in this very special moment. And once again, what God the Father says coming from that cloud, in a sense, offers a correction. Once again, he says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Listen to him. Peter, you don't got to be useful right now. Right? That's not the most important thing right now. You don't got to be so quick to try to take action and do something. Because there's actually something else that needs to happen first. And that's the second correction we see at the transfiguration. Listen to Jesus before you can be useful for Jesus. That's so important. That's so important. As pastors, we need to remind ourselves of that all the time. But if you are a follower of Christ, that applies to you as well. Listen before you can be useful. Listen to him before you can be useful for him. Another way to put it is to hear Jesus. You need to hear Jesus before you can go out and, and, and serve and give and right the wrongs that are around you in Jesus' name. Hear Jesus first. Listen to him first. Let him teach you first. Receive from him first. And I can't help but think of the story of Mary and Martha. Two sisters who approached Jesus in such different ways. Martha was so busy serving and working for Jesus. But Mary did what was better. In Luke 10, 39, it tells us that Martha had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. That's the exact same word as we see in our passage. She listened. She prioritized the listening first. It's not like Mary said, I don't, I'm not going to do anything for the rest of my life. I'm just going to sit here. But she prioritized listening. Yes, don't get me wrong. Christians are to be people who take action. Of course. The Bible never calls us to just be passive and inactive. And of course, we have to recognize that the idea of even listening to Jesus, even that word, listen, it implies first you're going to hear and learn, and then you're going to put into practice and do what Jesus said. Right? But the point is that there is an order to this, that we listen and learn first, and then we can live and do. I want to mention the essentials class again. It, it, it fits perfectly. That's why the first set of essentials classes that we offer is called learning. And then the second set is called living. Right? There's an order to this. And you can be sure the church exists. We exist to help you to hear the voice of Jesus more and more. To help you to see all things through the lens of Jesus more and more. And we want to be getting better and better at that for your sake, for the sake of our flock. And practically, whether we're talking about the church or just us as individual Christians, practically the way we hear the voice of Jesus is in the Bible. It's in his word. Right? There's no other way around it. There's no magical answer. It's in his word. It's in the scriptures. We need to turn to the scriptures again and again before we can be useful for him. The author Jerry Bridges in his seminal work, The Pursuit of Holiness, he writes this. It is hypocritical to pray for victory over our sins, yet be careless in our intake of the word of God. So poignant, but true. It is hypocritical to, to say, I want victory over my sins. And of course, thereby become useful for Jesus. But I'm never going to his word. I never care about his word. I, I think very lightly of his word. I just, I don't, I don't think to read it. I don't think to listen to the sermon. I don't think to do any of these things. That is hypocrisy. It doesn't make sense. 
And as we seek greater righteousness, as we seek greater justice, as we seek greater truth for ourselves, as well as for the world around us, it doesn't make sense to care about that, but be careless about God's word, about his scriptures. You know, we all want to be useful for Jesus. We all want to rise to the occasion. We all want to be good examples for our peers, for our children, for our students. And we all want more justice in our society, especially these days. I'm sure many, if not all of you at home, were eagerly watching and listening for the verdict in the Derek Chauvin case. And I do hope that you pray for the man, even as you celebrate that justice has been served. And even as you pray for greater justice, greater truth, greater righteousness in our country. We all want all these things. But to do any of it, the transfigured Christ and the voice of God the Father tell us we need to be hearing Jesus first. Through the reading of scripture, in worship like you're doing right now. And even in prayer as we, as we pray, the word of God gets applied to the deepest parts of our hearts. Let's not be careless with these things. And only then will we we be rightfully equipped with the graciousness and the humility as God's people, with the right lens to fight our own sin, to have greater compassion for those who are sinned against in the world around us. We will be better equipped, rightfully equipped to be useful for Jesus. You know what a great litmus test is uh, to see if you've actually followed the proper order of listening to Jesus first and then being useful for Jesus? Here's a great litmus test for you. It's quite simply the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As you seek to be useful for our Lord, which is not a bad thing, right? as you seek to to fight sin and as you seek to serve him and as you seek to, uh, uh, to do great things in the church, to do great things in the community, to do great things for society, you gotta ask yourself, am I exhibiting the fruit of the spirit? Of course, no one, no one exhibits the fruit of the spirit per- perfectly, but do I have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Are those, are those present? Because I guarantee you, if you are prioritizing listening to Jesus first, you will see the fruit of the Spirit as you seek to be useful for Him. After all, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. He's going to produce that, those fruit in you as you serve Him, as you give, as you seek to right the wrongs around you, as you seek to right the wrongs of your own heart. Do you see the fruit of the Spirit? You will if you're listening to Jesus before you can be useful for him. Back to the scene of the transfiguration. In the midst of all the frenzy and the fear and all these wrong things that are being said, the best thing happens. This is the best thing. And here I lament that our series, our sermon series is in the gospel of Mark rather than the gospel of Matthew because only Matthew's account of this event has what, what is, in my opinion, the best part. After everything happens, after Jesus is transfigured and he becomes so radiant, shining so bright, and after the, God the Father speaks from the cloud, and as the disciples are so terrified and they're falling face down, here's what happens. Matthew 17, 7 tells us, But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. Rise and have no fear. I love that part. That's my favorite part. Because Jesus is the radiant one who also stoops down and touches you and says, have no fear. This Jesus who is so intensely bright and so radiant, you know, that, that, that brightness and that radiance is unbearable and even terrifying. Until he stoops down and touches you and lifts you up. And then it becomes a benediction. Then it becomes a blessing. Then it becomes something you want and something you need for Jesus to shine upon you. 
only after, only because he has stooped down and touched you and raised you up and said, have no fear. The transfiguration of Jesus, it tells us that and it shows us that Jesus is so much bigger than we can ever imagine. He is so much more glorious. He is so much more radiant. He is so much more terrifying. And yet this Jesus is on your side. This Jesus has compassion towards you. This Jesus lowers himself for you and he sympathizes with your weaknesses. He sympathizes with your difficulties. He sympathizes with all the chaos that you're dealing with around you. And he says, have no fear. And even in a glorious scene like this, Jesus still talks about his own suffering. It's pretty amazing. He brings up his death to his disciples as well as his resurrection. And the disciples and Jesus, they talk about John the Baptist, how he's like Elijah coming to signal the coming of the Lord. But instead, John the Baptist got mistreated. And basically Jesus says, I'm going to get mistreated too. I'm going to get mistreated too. In Mark 9, 12, in verse 12, he says, Elijah does come first, referring to John the Baptist, to restore all things. And then talking about himself, he says, And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? What a contrast. We have this radiant Christ who would also suffer and be treated with contempt. And even after a glorious scene like the transfiguration, the story still ends with such sobering words. And therein lies the mystery of the transfigured Christ, radiant yet suffering. We have a Savior and a Lord who says, take up the cross, die to yourself daily and follow me. And yet at the same time, we also have a Lord who says, My yoke is easy and my burden is light and I will give you rest, rest for your souls. We have a a, a Jesus, a Lord, who, who in his transfiguration, he shines so bright. It's so intense. It's so radiant. And yet, and then immediately he, he starts talking about being treated with contempt. It's not one or the other. It's both and. The person of Jesus is always both and. And when you follow a savior like this, who says, die to yourself, take up your cross. Please don't think that that means that there's only going to be suffering. That the Christian life is meant to be all gloomy and drab. No, you have the radiance of Christ shining on you. You have a radiant Christ who still comes close enough to touch you and lift you up and say, have no fear. And that grants us a boldness and a peace that no amount of self-confidence or self-esteem could ever give you. Please don't forget the radiance of Christ as it shines upon you. Please don't forget the radiance. But also don't forget the cross. Jesus would indeed die. He would die and take our place on that cross. And although he's the radiant one, although he's the beloved son, For the sake of giving us truly a reason to have no fear. He would die for us. To grant us the forgiveness of sins. To grant us a new life in him. And when you follow this suffering savior. Of course it naturally means that not all of life as Christians is going to be glorious. We will be brought low at times. Perhaps many times. And we should never be surprised by that. And even in any given season where you yourself aren't brought low, we'll be loving on people who are, if you're following Jesus. In that sense, a Christian should always be acquainted with suffering, even if it's not their own. Because we don't run away from other people's suffering. We can actually draw near and come close and give that gentle touch of Jesus And even say, have no fear, because we have first received and learned from and listened to that radiant yet suffering Jesus himself. For all who are listening in today, if you don't know him, 
I pray that you would come to know and experience this Jesus. Our pastors would love to talk to you about Jesus. We'd love to pray for you. Uh, you, can, you can contact us through the email address that will show up at the end of this message. And for our Christ Central brothers and sisters, as well as all other Christians who are listening in, please don't give Jesus just another tent. He wants all of you. And before you can ever be useful for him, make sure you are listening. Don't be careless with his word, especially as he stoops down and says to you, have no fear. I love you. I died for you. And never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Hear him today. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we are so grateful that we belong to a savior like this. What a mystery. Lord, we stand in awe of this mystery that he is both radiant yet suffering. What an amazing combination. What an amazing uh, sight. What amazing theology that leads us to praise and worship as well as comfort. Knowing that we have a high priest who sympathizes with us. He sympathizes with our weakness. And he wants all of us. Oh Lord, I pray that you would grant us a greater and greater sense. A greater sense and a greater glimpse of this transfigured Jesus. Help, help us to see him more. Help us to know him more. Because we know if that is the case. If we're hearing him more. If we're listening to him more. Oh, it's going to change everything. It's going to color everything. It's going to change the way we see everything. Give us more of Jesus, we pray. Oh, by your grace, by your mercy, by your favor. Lord, grant us more of him. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
calls the one Our hearts were undeserving of With a grace so glorious Before the benediction, I do have a quick announcement to make. Uh, You may recall last November, I took a short one-month sabbatical, and I mentioned that I'd be taking the remainder of my sabbatical this year. And that time has come, and I will be on my sabbatical for the months of May and June. Uh, I will be using that time, of course, to rest as well as for family time. Uh, But I do want to remind you that sabbaticals are also meant for the further development of pastors. And so I will be taking an online counseling class as well with the Christian Counseling and Educational Foundation, CCEF. Uh, Priscilla and I, we definitely appreciate your prayers for us during this season. And we look forward to seeing you again in July. Now, would you receive this benediction, this blessing from God? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen.